The boxer is a mollusoid of average size with tawny coloured short hair or striped with or without white. Since its torso can be inscribed in a square, it can therefore be defined as a galloper. We can compare it to a light athlete who combines a large amount of strength, power and speed. It is a harmonious animal, endowed with a lean, strongly developed musculature that shows up plastically under the skin. Its movements are extremely vivacious, of sure gait. In addition to being elastic, its stride is smooth and broad with a bold and noble carriage. One could talk about the boxer for hours without exhausting the subject. Naturally, so as not to bore you, we will just offer you some of the more interesting notions. But the only way to understand what a boxer is exactly is to have one for a friend. Thus, one will be able to comprehend the meaning of love, joie de vivre, dignity, courage, joy, sensitivity, vitality, loyalty and intelligence. For the boxer is all this, and also much more, because the boxer is simply the boxer. The boxer is a mollusoid of average size with tawny coloured short hair or striped with or without white. Since its torso can be inscribed in a square, it can therefore be defined as a galloper. We can compare it to a light athlete who combines a large amount of strength, power and speed. It is a harmonious animal, endowed with a lean, strongly developed musculature that shows up plastically under the skin. Its movements are extremely vivacious, of sure gait. In addition to being elastic, its stride is smooth and broad with a bold and noble carriage. One could talk about the boxer for hours without exhausting the subject. Naturally, so as not to bore you, we will just offer you some of the more interesting notions. But the only way to understand what a boxer is exactly is to have one for a friend. Thus, one will be able to comprehend the meaning of love, joie de vivre, dignity, courage, joy, sensitivity, vitality, loyalty and intelligence. For the boxer is all this, and also much more, because the boxer is simply the boxer. The boxer is a mollusoid of average size with tawny coloured short hair or striped with or without white. Since its torso can be inscribed in a square, it can therefore be defined as a galloper. We can compare it to a light athlete who combines a large amount of strength, power and speed. It is a harmonious animal, endowed with a lean, strongly developed musculature that shows up plastically under the skin. Its movements are extremely vivacious, of sure gait. In addition to being elastic, its stride is smooth and broad with a bold and noble carriage. One could talk about the boxer for hours without exhausting the subject. Naturally, so as not to bore you, we will just offer you some of the more interesting notions. But the only way to understand what a boxer is exactly is to have one for a friend. Thus, one will be able to comprehend the meaning of love, joie de vivre, dignity, courage, joy, sensitivity, vitality, loyalty and intelligence. For the boxer is all this, and also much more, because the boxer is simply the boxer. The boxer, as we know it nowadays, is very unlike the boxer of the first years of the 20th century, when the selection of this breed was in its infancy, and is even more different from its most direct ancestors, the German Brabanter, Bullenbeiser, and the English Bulldog. According to historians and experts of the breed, in the second half of the 19th century in Germany, both the future parents of the boxer were present. The Bulldog, very different from the current one, was very much in fashion. It managed to find favour with the German people through its appeal as a fearsome fighter. It was the result of a selection carried out in consanguinity in England, intent on enhancing its gladiatorial traits to obtain better performances in the then famous English bull baiting, fighting against bulls. With regard to the Bullenbeiser, we can say that it was highly regarded for several centuries in Germany, first as an excellent assistant in hunting big game, against which it had to fight one to one, and later on as an aggressive and fearless fighter in arenas. It was a member of that type of dog which took their name from their use and from the place where they were selected. Bullenbeiser, Bullbaiter, Barenbeiser, Bearbaiter, Buffalobeiser, Buffalobaiter, 
Zalpaker, attacker of sows and wild boars. Brabanter, small and big if originating from the Brabanter region in Belgium. Danziger, if originating from Poland. We know for certain that the type of dog of interest to us in determining the boxer's second parent is the Brabanter Bullenbeiser. These dogs were morphologically very heterogeneous, but decidedly homogeneous as far as character was concerned. This is the character identikit of the boxer's parents. Marked aggressiveness, very hard constitution, and therefore total insensitivity to pain, extreme impulse to fight, unrestrained courage. The boxer is therefore the direct descendant of two fighting dogs. 1835 was the year that finally marked the abolition of fights between animals. In 1894, Friedrich Robert, an officer in the German colonial army and passionate dog lover, moved to Munich where with Erold König and Rudolf Höppner shared strong enthusiasm intent on creating a new German breed of dog for utility, accompaniment and company. In 1895, the first experimental class for boxers took place in a show organized by the San Bernardo Club. On that occasion, only one boxer specimen was presented. Mulbar's Flocky, that later on was the first boxer registered in the German Book of Origins. Flocky represented the first step of the long and brilliant selective path of the boxer breed. Therefore, with Flocky's arrival, the boxer came into existence. The foundation of the German Boxer Club in Munich dates back to the same year, 1895, and afterwards the two versions of the standard. Blanca von Argentor, Flocky's sister, was proclaimed champion boxer during those years. But among the countless dogs used, only four seriously contributed to the fixing of the typical boxer characteristics. These names are still present today in many pedigrees of our champions and are Flock San Salvador, 14 Tony male, Votan, 46 striped male, Meta von der Passage, 30 white female with some striped patches. Mirzel, 44, tawny female from Meyer's Lord. The name of Bosco von Immengrün, a male with white stripes, can be added to these names, but in a secondary role. These dogs are the real founders of the breed, the milestones on which all the selection work reaching us is based. Meta von der Passage, the grandmother of the boxer, extraordinary bitch of Blanca von Argentor, was the most important name of the group and produced a series of dogs of very high value and typicality. Ugo von Falzgau, Ginger von Argentor, Kurt von Falzgau, and finally the extremely prestigious Rolf von Vogelsberg. Rolf was in possession of extraordinary character, morphological and typicality qualities that he passed on actually improved to his descendants. Note the exceptional size for that time, the very typical head and a rear never seen before then. He was the backbone and brought success to the prestigious Von Dom kennels of the Stockmans. From Rolf von Vogelsberg, passing quickly by the great Wein von Dom, Sigurd von Dom and Zorn von Dom, we arrive at the so-called champion of champions, Lustig von Dom. Born in 1933 in Germany and transferred in 1937 to America after having won every honour a boxer can win. Very typical with a not very accentuated stop, but with an excellent head and ideal ratios, excellent size, compact, square, strong skeleton, elegant, it is the progenitor of the modern boxer. Lustig was a dog ahead of its time. In 1960 in England, from a mixing of blood deriving from Lustig von Dom with Dutch and American blood, was born the champion that was to give new impulse to the breed's path. Witherford Hot Chestnut, bred by Mrs. Pat Withers, this superb dog rejoins the von Dom bloodline. Imported as a puppy in Germany in the von Schutting kennels, it transmitted its extraordinary traits of elegance and distinction to its German offspring. From Witherford Hot Chestnut in Germany, meanwhile, saw the birth of Carlo Ut Gutzel, a boxer of which it is obligatory to speak for the immense importance that it holds in the breed's history and for its extraordinary and marked typicality. Carlo Ut Gutzel passed into history for having given the entire boxer world the ideal boxer. His nephew, Carlo von Henningshof, the King Carlo thus named, won all a boxer could win at world level. 
Extremely typical, he inherited the nobility of hot chestnut, but showed a strong boxer essence, which none of his ancestors possessed so prominently. He is considered the most complete boxer, unique phenotype qualities, exceptional character traits, infinite genotypic power, he is present in the pedigree of approximately 90% of today's boxer population. Before dealing with the standard, in the following images we can see an unusual picture for a dog, but which adapts itself perfectly to the boxer breed. The boxer is a lurcher, even before a guard dog. Therefore, its construction and its typicality must be strictly linked to its functional character. In this regard, the theory of Ivor Ward Davies and of Bosey is certainly useful. The boxer seen as a car. The head. The head of a boxer must ensure a firm hold that is obtained with strong teeth, well set in the maxillary bones. Prognathism is a safety catch that helps the lever action, correct width and length development of the maxillary rami. The nose should be wide and slightly raised on the line of the nasal channel to help respiration. Hypotype and hypotype will never be able to ensure a secure hold. A cranium which is not too contained guarantees the space for the cerebral computer. The extensible arm. The neck has the function of connection between the head and mobile frame like an extensible arm that guides the position of the head. It must be long and flexible with developed muscular fasciculi, never short or too long and thin. The machine. The engine of a boxer, represented by the heart and lungs, requires ample space for its functioning, therefore a deep thorax and a good hooping of the costate. Without this space, the engine would be unable to produce the necessary power combined with resistance. The chassis, frame, corresponds to the vertebral column that must be flexible to transmit the impulse of the machine. The well-developed dorsolumbar muscles support the vertebral column, ensuring flexibility. The mobile frame. By mobile frame is meant the movement of the boxer that receives its impulse from the rear, the rachis transmits it, the shoulders and the front translate it into forward thrust, and the head-neck equaliser has a counterweight and balancing function. Both the impulse as well as forward thrust require appropriate angulations. The angulations of the fore and hindquarters must be perfectly balanced, otherwise the boxer's movement would suffer as a result. Therefore, the movement follows the rules of mechanical physics and, in particular, the muscles act as power in a system of levers where the fulcrum is often represented by the ground and resistance by a joint. The suspension. Correct joints act as the suspension necessary to absorb knocks received from the ground. The boxer, as we know it nowadays, is very unlike the boxer of the first years of the 20th century, when the selection of this breed was in its infancy, and is even more different from its most direct ancestors, the German Brabanter Bullenbeiser and the English Bulldog. According to historians and experts of the breed, in the second half of the 19th century in Germany, both the future parents of the boxer were present. The Bulldog, very different from the current one, was very much in fashion. It managed to find favour with the German people through its appeal as a fearsome fighter. It was the result of a selection carried out in consanguinity in England, intent on enhancing its gladiatorial traits to obtain better performances in the then famous English bull baiting, fighting against bulls. With regard to the Bullenbeiser, we can say that it was highly regarded for several centuries in Germany, first as an excellent assistant in hunting big game, against which it had to fight one to one, and later on as an aggressive and fearless fighter in arenas. It was a member of that type of dog which took their name from their use and from the place where they were selected. Bullenbeiser, bull baiter, Barenbeiser, bear baiter, Buffalo baiter, buffalo baiter, Zalpacker, attacker of sows and wild boars, Brabanter, small and big if originating from the Brabanter region in Belgium, Danziger if originating from Poland. We know for certain that the type of dog of interest to us in determining the boxer's second parent is the Brabanter Bullenbeiser. 
These dogs were morphologically very heterogeneous, but decidedly homogeneous as far as character was concerned. This is the character identikit of the boxer's parents. Marked aggressiveness, very hard constitution, and therefore total insensitivity to pain, extreme impulse to fight, unrestrained courage. The boxer is therefore the direct descendant of two fighting dogs. 1835 was the year that finally marked the abolition of fights between animals. In 1894, Friedrich Robert, an officer in the German colonial army and passionate dog lover, moved to Munich where with Erold König and Rudolf Höppner shared strong enthusiasm intent on creating a new German breed of dog for utility, accompaniment and company. In 1895, the first experimental class for boxers took place in a show organized by the San Bernardo Club. On that occasion, only one boxer specimen was presented, Mulbar's Flocky, that later on was the first boxer registered in the German Book of Origins. Flocky represented the first step of the long and brilliant selective path of the boxer breed. Therefore, with Flocky's arrival, the boxer came into existence. The foundation of the German Boxer Club in Munich dates back to the same year, 1895, and afterwards the two versions of the standard. Blanca von Argentor, Flocky's sister, was proclaimed champion boxer during those years. But among the countless dogs used, only four seriously contributed to the fixing of the typical boxer characteristics. These names are still present today in many pedigrees of our champions, and are Flock San Salvador, 14 Tony male, Votan, 46 striped male, Meta von der Passage, 30 white female with some striped patches, Mirzel, 44 tawny female from Meyer's Lord, the name of Bosco von Immengrün, a male with white stripes, can be added to these names, but in a secondary role. These dogs are the real founders of the breed, the milestones on which all the selection work reaching us is based. Meta von der Passage, the grandmother of the boxer, extraordinary bitch of Blanca von Argentor, was the most important name of the group and produced a series of dogs of very high value and typicality. Ugo von Falzgau, Ginger von Argentor, Kurt von Falzgau, and finally the extremely prestigious Rolf von Vogelsberg. Rolf was in possession of extraordinary character, morphological and typicality qualities that he passed on actually improved to his descendants. Note the exceptional size for that time, the very typical head and a rear never seen before then. He was the backbone and brought success to the prestigious Von Dom kennels of the Stockmans. From Rolf von Vogelsberg, passing quickly by the great Wein von Dom, Sigurd von Dom and Zorn von Dom, we arrive at the so-called champion of champions, Lustig von Dom. Born in 1933 in Germany and transferred in 1937 to America after having won every honour a boxer can win. Very typical with a not very accentuated stop, but with an excellent head and ideal ratios, excellent size, compact, square, strong skeleton, elegant, it is the progenitor of the modern boxer. Lustig was a dog ahead of its time. In 1960 in England, from a mixing of blood deriving from Lustig von Dom with Dutch and American blood, was born the champion that was to give new impulse to the breed's path. Witherford Hot Chestnut, bred by Mrs. Pat Withers, this superb dog rejoins the von Dom bloodline. Imported as a puppy in Germany in the von Schutting kennels, it transmitted its extraordinary traits of elegance and distinction to its German offspring. From Witherford Hot Chestnut in Germany, meanwhile, saw the birth of Carlo Ut Gutzel, a boxer of which it is obligatory to speak for the immense importance that it holds in the breed's history and for its extraordinary and marked typicality. Carlo Ut Gutzel passed into history for having given the entire boxer world the ideal boxer. His nephew, Carlo von Henningshof, the King Carlo thus named, won all a boxer could win at world level. Extremely typical, he inherited the nobility of hot chestnut, but showed a strong boxer essence, which none of his ancestors possessed so prominently. He is considered the most complete boxer, unique phenotype qualities, exceptional character traits, infinite genotypic power. He is present in the pedigree of approximately 90% of today's boxer population.
Before dealing with the standard, in the following images we can see an unusual picture for a dog, but which adapts itself perfectly to the boxer breed. The boxer is a lurcher, even before a guard dog, therefore its construction and its typicality must be strictly linked to its functional character. In this regard, the theory of Ivor Ward Davies and of Bosey is certainly useful, the boxer seen as a car. The head. The head of a boxer must ensure a firm hold that is obtained with strong teeth, well set in the maxillary bones. Prognathism is a safety catch that helps the lever action, correct width and length development of the maxillary rami. The nose should be wide and slightly raised on the line of the nasal channel to help respiration. Hypotype and hypotype will never be able to ensure a secure hold. A cranium which is not too contained guarantees the space for the cerebral computer. The extensible arm. The neck has the function of connection between the head and mobile frame like an extensible arm that guides the position of the head. It must be long and flexible with developed muscular fasciculi, never short or too long and thin. The machine. The engine of a boxer, represented by the heart and lungs, requires ample space for its functioning, therefore a deep thorax and a good hooping of the costate. Without this space, the engine would be unable to produce the necessary power combined with resistance. The chassis, frame, corresponds to the vertebral column that must be flexible to transmit the impulse of the machine. The well-developed dorsolumbar muscles support the vertebral column, ensuring flexibility. The mobile frame. By mobile frame is meant the movement of the boxer that receives its impulse from the rear, the rachis transmits it, the shoulders and the front translate it into forward thrust, and the head-neck equaliser has a counterweight and balancing function. Both the impulse as well as forward thrust require appropriate angulations. The angulations of the fore and hindquarters must be perfectly balanced, otherwise the boxer's movement would suffer as a result. Therefore, the movement follows the rules of mechanical physics and, in particular, the muscles act as power in a system of levers where the fulcrum is often represented by the ground and resistance by a joint. The suspension. Correct joints act as the suspension necessary to absorb knocks received from the ground. The boxer, as we know it nowadays, is very unlike the boxer of the first years of the 20th century when the selection of this breed was in its infancy, and is even more different from its most direct ancestors, the German Brabanter Bullenbeiser and the English Bulldog. According to historians and experts of the breed, in the second half of the 19th century in Germany, both the future parents of the boxer were present. The Bulldog, very different from the current one, was very much in fashion. It managed to find favour with the German people through its appeal as a fearsome fighter. It was the result of a selection carried out in consanguinity in England, intent on enhancing its gladiatorial traits to obtain better performances in the then famous English bull baiting, fighting against bulls. With regard to the Bullenbeiser, we can say that it was highly regarded for several centuries in Germany, first as an excellent assistant in hunting big game, against which it had to fight one to one, and later on as an aggressive and fearless fighter in arenas. It was a member of that type of dog which took their name from their use and from the place where they were selected. Bullenbeiser, bull baiter, Barenbeiser, bear baiter, Buffalobeiser, buffalo baiter, Zalpacker, attacker of sows and wild boars, Brabanter, small and big if originating from the Brabanter region in Belgium, Danziger if originating from Poland. We know for certain that the type of dog of interest to us in determining the boxer's second parent is the Brabanter Bullenbeiser. These dogs were morphologically very heterogeneous, but decidedly homogeneous as far as character was concerned. This is the character identicate of the boxer's parents. Marked aggressiveness, very hard constitution, and therefore total insensitivity to pain. Extreme impulse to fight. Unrestrained courage. The boxer is therefore the direct descendant of two fighting dogs. 1835 was the year that finally marked the abolition of fights between animals. 
In 1894, Friedrich Robert, an officer in the German colonial army and passionate dog lover, moved to Munich where with Erold König and Rudolf Höppner shared strong enthusiasm intent on creating a new German breed of dog for utility, accompaniment and company. In 1895, the first experimental class for boxers took place in a show organised by the San Bernardo Club. On that occasion, only one boxer specimen was presented. Mulbar's Flocky, that later on was the first boxer registered in the German Book of Origins. Flocky represented the first step of the long and brilliant selective path of the boxer breed. Therefore, with Flocky's arrival, the boxer came into existence. The foundation of the German Boxer Club in Munich dates back to the same year, 1895, and afterwards the two versions of the standard. Blanca von Argentor, Flocky's sister, was proclaimed champion boxer during those years. But among the countless dogs used, only four seriously contributed to the fixing of the typical boxer characteristics. These names are still present today in many pedigrees of our champions, and are Flock San Salvador, 14 Tony male, Votan, 46 striped male, Meta von der Passage, 30 white female with some striped patches, Mirzel, 44, tawny female from Meyer's Lord. The name of Bosco von Immengrün, a male with white stripes, can be added to these names, but in a secondary role. These dogs are the real founders of the breed, the milestones on which all the selection work reaching us is based. Meta von der Passage, the grandmother of the boxer, extraordinary bitch of Blanca von Argentor, was the most important name of the group and produced a series of dogs of very high value and typicality. Ugo von Falzgau, Ginger von Argentor, Kurt von Falzgau, and finally the extremely prestigious Rolf von Vogelsberg. Rolf was in possession of extraordinary character, morphological and typicality qualities that he passed on actually improved to his descendants. Note the exceptional size for that time, the very typical head and a rear never seen before then. He was the backbone and brought success to the prestigious von Dom kennels of the Stockmans. From Rolf von Vogelsberg, passing quickly by the great Wein von Dom, Sigurd von Dom and Zorn von Dom, we arrive at the so-called champion of champions, Lustig von Dom. Born in 1933 in Germany and transferred in 1937 to America after having won every honour a boxer can win. Very typical with a not very accentuated stop, but with an excellent head and ideal ratios, excellent size, compact, square, strong skeleton, elegant, it is the progenitor of the modern boxer. Lustig was a dog ahead of its time. In 1960 in England, from a mixing of blood deriving from Lustig von Dom with Dutch and American blood, was born the champion that was to give new impulse to the breed's path. Witherford Hot Chestnut, bred by Mrs. Pat Withers, this superb dog rejoins the von Dom bloodline. Imported as a puppy in Germany in the von Schutting kennels, it transmitted its extraordinary traits of elegance and distinction to its German offspring. From Witherford Hot Chestnut in Germany, meanwhile, saw the birth of Carlo Ut Gutzel, a boxer of which it is obligatory to speak for the immense importance that it holds in the breed's history and for its extraordinary and marked typicality. Carlo Ut Gutzel passed into history for having given the entire boxer world the ideal boxer. His nephew, Carlo von Henningshof, the King Carlo thus named, won all a boxer could win at world level. Extremely typical, he inherited the nobility of hot chestnut, but showed a strong boxer essence, which none of his ancestors possessed so prominently. He is considered the most complete boxer, unique phenotype qualities, exceptional character traits, infinite genotypic power. He is present in the pedigree of approximately 90% of today's boxer population. Before dealing with the standard, in the following images we can see an unusual picture for a dog, but which adapts itself perfectly to the boxer breed. The boxer is a lurcher, even before a guard dog, therefore its construction and its typicality must be strictly linked to its functional character. In this regard, the theory of Ivor Ward-Davies and of Bosey is certainly useful. 
the boxer seen as a car. The head. The head of a boxer must ensure a firm hold that is obtained with strong teeth, well set in the maxillary bones. Prognathism is a safety catch that helps the lever action, correct width and length development of the maxillary rami. The nose should be wide and slightly raised on the line of the nasal channel to help respiration. Hypotype and hypotype will never be able to ensure a secure hold. A cranium which is not too contained guarantees the space for the cerebral computer. The extensible arm. The neck has the function of connection between the head and mobile frame like an extensible arm that guides the position of the head. It must be long and flexible with developed muscular fasciculi, never short or too long and thin. The machine. The engine of a boxer, represented by the heart and lungs, requires ample space for its functioning, therefore a deep thorax and a good hooping of the costate. Without this space, the engine would be unable to produce the necessary power combined with resistance. The chassis, frame, corresponds to the vertebral column that must be flexible to transmit the impulse of the machine. The well-developed dorsolumbar muscles support the vertebral column, ensuring flexibility. The mobile frame. By mobile frame is meant the movement of the boxer that receives its impulse from the rear, the rachis transmits it, the shoulders and the front translate it into forward thrust, and the head-neck equaliser has a counterweight and balancing function. Both the impulse as well as forward thrust require appropriate angulations. The angulations of the fore and hind quarters must be perfectly balanced, otherwise the boxer's movement would suffer as a result. Therefore, the movement follows the rules of mechanical physics and, in particular, the muscles act as power in a system of levers where the fulcrum is often represented by the ground and resistance by a joint. The suspension. Correct joints act as the suspension necessary to absorb knocks received from the ground. After the preliminary record drawn up by Erald Koenig in 1896 to judge at the Munich show held in the same year, a first standard was drafted on 14th of July 1902, which was followed by another in 1905, one in 1920, and others in 1925 and in 1938. The one in force today dates from 1990. It has recently been amended in Germany where the tail is preferred in non-amputated form. The head. The total length is around 0.32 of the height at the withers. It is clear cut, unlined, and lean. Brachycephalus, the bizygomatic width of the cranium, is greater than half of the total length of the head. The directions of the upper longitudinal axes of the cranium and muzzle are convergent with each other. The cranium length from the occipital apophysis to the inside corner of the eye is double the length of the muzzle, from the inside corner of the eye to the point of the nose. This ratio of 2 to 1 should be observed as much as possible. A very accentuated stop. The eyes should be as dark as possible, of almost roundish shape. High attached ears, amputated or not. Full muzzle, square with wide dentition. The teeth must be strong, of normal dimensions and development, and never visible when the mouth is closed. The boxer is prognathous, well-pronounced chin. The lateral sides of the muzzle and those of the cranium are parallel to each other. Front limbs, solid, with strong skeleton. Viewed from the front, they are parallel to each other and straight. The shoulder is long, well inclined on the horizontal, from 48 degrees to 55 degrees. The length of the arm is approximately equal to that of the shoulder, and with it form the fundamental scapular humeral angle for the movement and the correct thrust of the boxer. Touching elbows. Long forearm, strong and straight, well-closed feet, cat-like. Torso. It should be compact. It expresses elegance and, at the same time, power. Strong skeleton of solid construction. The boxer is as long as it is high. The chest is full, prominent, muscular. The chest is well descended. There should be high withers that are noticeable in the dorsal line. Wide, muscular and strong back. Short, very muscular and compact loin a slightly inclined and wide rump. Tail with high attachment, amputated at the height of the third coccygeal vertebra, it should be carried boldly. Rear limbs, 
Very strong, correctly angled, very muscular. The thigh should be wide, muscular, long. The leg length is slightly less than that of the thigh. Strong and solid hock. It forms the talocrural joint with the leg. The angle of movement is fundamental. The tibiometatarsic angle around 140 degrees. Slightly less rounded feet than at the front. Height and weight, males 56 to 63 centimeters, approximately 35 kilograms. Females 53 to 59 centimeters, approximately 25 kilograms. Hair colors allowed are all shades of tawny with a black mask at the head and striped that is formed by a tawny background with black or dark streaks that follow the direction of the ribs. The color and stripes must be clearly separate from each other. Movement. The movement in the boxer is of primary importance. It must cover a lot of ground, be smooth, harmonious, elegant, vigorous and dynamic without the animal tiring, never ill at ease or ungainly. To achieve this movement, the boxer requires a strong skeleton. The rear and front angle should never be too closed or too open. Powerful and long muscles, long osseous radii, downward deep well-hooked chest, solid upper dorsal line with a flexible rachis. With these requisites, the boxer will be an excellent functional animal and it will be a pleasure to see it in motion. After the preliminary record drawn up by Erald Koenig in 1896 to judge at the Munich show held in the same year, a first standard was drafted on 14th of July 1902, which was followed by another in 1905, one in 1920, and others in 1925 and in 1938. The one in force today dates from 1990. It has recently been amended in Germany where the tail is preferred in non-amputated form. The head. The total length is around 0.32 of the height at the withers. It is clear-cut, unlined and lean. Brachycephalus, the bizygomatic width of the cranium, is greater than half of the total length of the head. The directions of the upper longitudinal axes of the cranium and muzzle are convergent with each other. The cranium length from the occipital apophysis to the inside corner of the eye is double the length of the muzzle, from the inside corner of the eye to the point of the nose. This ratio of 2 to 1 should be observed as much as possible. A very accentuated stop. The eyes should be as dark as possible, of almost roundish shape, high attached ears, amputated or not. Full muzzle, square with wide dentition. The teeth must be strong, of normal dimensions and development, and never visible when the mouth is closed. The boxer is prognathous, well-pronounced chin. The lateral sides of the muscle and those of the cranium are parallel to each other. Front limbs, solid, with strong skeleton. Viewed from the front, they are parallel to each other and straight. The shoulder is long, well inclined on the horizontal, from 48 degrees to 55 degrees. The length of the arm is approximately equal to that of the shoulder and with it form the fundamental scapulohumeral angle for the movement and the correct thrust of the boxer. Touching elbows, Long forearm, strong and straight, well-closed feet, cat-like. Torso. It should be compact. It expresses elegance and, at the same time, power. Strong skeleton of solid construction. The boxer is as long as it is high. The chest is full, prominent, muscular. The chest is well descended. There should be high withers that are noticeable in the dorsal line. Wide, muscular and strong back. Short, very muscular and compact loin a slightly inclined and wide rump. Tail with high attachment, amputated at the height of the third coccygeal vertebra, it should be carried boldly. Rear limbs, very strong, correctly angled, very muscular. The thigh should be wide, muscular, long. The leg length is slightly less than that of the thigh. Strong and solid hock. It forms the talocrural joint with the leg. The angle of movement is fundamental the tibiometatarsic angle around 140 degrees. Slightly less rounded feet than at the front. Height and weight, males 56 to 63 centimeters, approximately 35 kilograms. Females 53 to 59 centimeters, approximately 25 kilograms. 
Hair colours allowed are all shades of tawny with a black mask at the head and striped that is formed by a tawny background with black or dark streaks that follow the direction of the ribs. The colour and stripes must be clearly separate from each other. Movement. The movement in the boxer is of primary importance. It must cover a lot of ground, be smooth, harmonious, elegant, vigorous and dynamic without the animal tiring, never ill at ease or ungainly. To achieve this movement, the boxer requires a strong skeleton. The rear and front angle should never be too closed or too open. Powerful and long muscles, long osseous radii, downward deep well-hooked chest, solid upper dorsal line with a flexible rachis. With these requisites, the boxer will be an excellent functional animal and it will be a pleasure to see it in motion. After the preliminary record drawn up by Erald Koenig in 1896 to judge at the Munich show held in the same year, a first standard was drafted on 14th of July 1902 which was followed by another in 1905, one in 1920, and others in 1925 and in 1938. The one in force today dates from 1990. It has recently been amended in Germany where the tail is preferred in non-amputated form. The head. The total length is around 0.32 of the height at the withers. It is clear-cut, unlined and lean. Brachycephalus, the bizygomatic width of the cranium, is greater than half of the total length of the head. The directions of the upper longitudinal axes of the cranium and muzzle are convergent with each other. The cranium length from the occipital apophysis to the inside corner of the eye is double the length of the muzzle, from the inside corner of the eye to the point of the nose. This ratio of 2 to 1 should be observed as much as possible. A very accentuated stop. The eyes should be as dark as possible, of almost roundish shape, high attached ears, amputated or not, full muzzle, square with wide dentition. The teeth must be strong, of normal dimensions and development, and never visible when the mouth is closed. The boxer is prognathous, well pronounced chin. The lateral sides of the muzzle and those of the cranium are parallel to each other. Front limbs, solid, with strong skeleton. Viewed from the front, they are parallel to each other and straight. The shoulder is long, well inclined on the horizontal, from 48 degrees to 55 degrees. The length of the arm is approximately equal to that of the shoulder, and with it form the fundamental scapulohumeral angle for the movement and the correct thrust of the boxer. Touching elbows, long forearm, strong and straight, well-closed feet, cat-like. Torso. It should be compact, it expresses elegance and at the same time power, strong skeleton of solid construction. The boxer is as long as it is high. The chest is full, prominent, muscular. The chest is well descended. There should be high withers that are noticeable in the dorsal line, wide, muscular and strong back. Short, very muscular and compact loin. A slightly inclined and wide rump. Tail with high attachment, amputated at the height of the third coccygeal vertebra, it should be carried boldly. Rear limbs, very strong, correctly angled, very muscular. The thigh should be wide, muscular, long. The leg length is slightly less than that of the thigh. Strong and solid hock. It forms the talocrural joint with the leg. The angle of movement is fundamental. The tibiometatarsic angle around 140 degrees slightly less rounded feet than at the front. Height and weight, males 56 to 63 centimeters, approximately 35 kilograms. Females 53 to 59 centimeters, approximately 25 kilograms. Hair colors allowed are all shades of tawny with a black mask at the head and striped that is formed by a tawny background with black or dark streaks that follow the direction of the ribs. The colour and stripes must be clearly separate from each other. Movement. The movement in the boxer is of primary importance. It must cover a lot of ground, be smooth, harmonious, elegant, vigorous and dynamic without the animal tiring, never ill at ease or ungainly. To achieve this movement, the boxer requires a strong skeleton. The rear and front angle should never be too closed or too open. Powerful and long muscles, long osseous radii, 
downward, deep, well-hooked chest, solid upper dorsal line with a flexible rachis. With these requisites, the boxer will be an excellent functional animal and it will be a pleasure to see it in motion. Louis Bromfeld, the popular American novelist, lived in the first half of the 20th century, and in his Pleasant Valley, he provides a splendid description of the boxer's character, which he knew well, having owned various specimens. Here is what he writes about the entry of the boxer Rex into its house in Paris. It entered the room absolutely sure of itself, took a few steps with dignity, stopped, and looked at us. We certainly did not intimidate it, on the contrary. Its personality, its character did not allow us any familiarity. It accepted one of my timid caresses almost like a favour, but having become acquainted, I understood that which it expressed with its look, affection, devotion, loyalty, dignity and independence. In one of his splendid books on boxers, an internationally renowned judge who has raised the breed for many years, discussing their character, writes, the boxer is first of all personality. This is the boxer, a creature that tends to assert itself as a dog and that possesses strong individuality. One should never forget that the ancestors of our canine friend and companion had to confront dangers and perils for centuries and that a strong character has been genetically transmitted from generation to generation, capable of fending for itself and of taking appropriate decisions in situations that arose. Whether dealing with a decision to immediately attack a furious bear or to await the arrival of reinforcements, to stop an unruly bull or to intimidate it only a little, or to intervene with speed and decision in helping its master or to wait for an order from him. In every situation, the boxer's ancestors have always had to act by instinct and for the best. And for them, their life was often at stake. The individuality with which the boxer is endowed makes it a sincere and loyal friend of the master and family, but with man it establishes a relationship of collaboration and of mutual trust, without though ever entering into competition with him. They are intelligent and sensitive dogs and will accept man's superiority only if the latter is aware of how to deserve it. You will never be able to impose your own personality on a boxer through brutal or violent means. He needs to love and respect his master, and only when consideration and trust are exhibited will he show the best of what he is capable. The exceptional intelligence with which the boxer is endowed allows it to learn anything quickly and not to forget it afterwards. From the puppy stage, it is very curious about what is happening around it, and it maintains this attention, even if in different ways also as an adult. It is very important characteristic for a guard dog, which the boxer is, since it allows it to always be vigilantly attentive towards whatever is happening. Character traits are as important as the morphological ones, since these are hereditarily transmitted in a percentage ranging from 40 to 60%. Certainly, it is not only the attractive and charming aspect that has brought the boxer worldwide success. Personality made up of sweetness, sociality, constitution, decision, courage, determination in combat and balance have also played their part. Among the many who have become fond of the breed, countless individuals have appreciated its traits of intelligence, sociability and proportionate aggressiveness during World War II. Thus the boxer legend was born. A legend that comes from afar, that has crossed the millennia and the continents, and which must not be lost and let down by a fistful of money. The true boxer is a marvellous dog, full of life, of pride, joy, energy, and why not, love. It learns with ease. It is not for nothing that it has been used in circus acts and as a dog actor. It has uncommon docility and a fineness of emotions. Hence why this guard and attack dog has been trained as a guide dog for the blind. It is of exceptional constitution that allows it to withstand unpleasant experiences without being harmed. It is the reason for which it excels in civil defence operations, especially those that require intervention on rough ground that may injure its legs. It has provided valid proof of being effective as a police dog, message dog, track and guard dog. The boxer is all this and much more besides, a dog for which character is of equal if not greater importance than physical appearance. If you have children at home, the boxer will provide a sweet game companion for them and worthy of their utmost trust. In its exuberance and its effusive force, a boxer of correct character will never exceed if it realises it is in the company of weaker individuals, whether it be children, the elderly, the sick or other small animals. 
it is touching to see how a dog, perhaps vivacious and ebullient, shows restraint and keeps its gestures in proportion to the ability of those in its presence to withstand them. It will coax smaller children without ever touching them, running round in circles and frantically wagging the end of its tail, its ears pushed back on the cranium and its sweet look will show its tender friendship. A warning, however. It will not allow anybody to harm its young friends, not even you. And if you were to scold them, it would certainly try to good-naturedly come between you and them to prevent your intervention. The boxer is a gentle giant, aware of its strength and eager to show its affection. It is said to be good-natured, but is not naive. Heaven help whoever dares to threaten its dear ones, whoever tries to harm those he loves or has placed under his protection, whoever shows themselves as enemies of his small friends, because in this case the reaction will always be instantaneous, undaunted, fearsome and very dangerous. The boxer never attacks, but if forced to do so, all the power contained in its athletic fighter body is released in an instant and deadly manner and its powerful bite together with the extraordinary massive impact will get the better of any unwary aggressor in a split second. The real boxer is thus a marvellous concentrate of intelligence, strength, courage, loyalty, goodness and love. Louis Bromfeld, the popular American novelist, lived in the first half of the 20th century, and in his Pleasant Valley he provides a splendid description of the boxer's character, which he knew well, having owned various specimens. Here is what he writes about the entry of the boxer Rex into its house in Paris. It entered the room absolutely sure of itself, took a few steps with dignity, stopped and looked at us. We certainly did not intimidate it, on the contrary. Its personality, its character did not allow us any familiarity. It accepted one of my timid caresses almost like a favour, but having become acquainted, I understood that which it expressed with its look, affection, devotion, loyalty, dignity and independence. In one of his splendid books on boxers, an internationally renowned judge who has raised the breed for many years, discussing their character, writes, The boxer is first of all personality. This is the boxer, a creature that tends to assert itself as a dog and that possesses strong individuality. One should never forget that the ancestors of our canine friend and companion had to confront dangers and perils for centuries and that a strong character has been genetically transmitted from generation to generation, capable of fending for itself and of taking appropriate decisions in situations that arose. Whether dealing with a decision to immediately attack a furious bear or to await the arrival of reinforcements, to stop an unruly bull or to intimidate it only a little, or to intervene with speed and decision in helping its master or to wait for an order from him. In every situation, the boxer's ancestors have always had to act by instinct and for the best. And for them, their life was often at stake. The individuality with which the boxer is endowed makes it a sincere and loyal friend of the master and family, but with man it establishes a relationship of collaboration and of mutual trust, without though ever entering into competition with him. They are intelligent and sensitive dogs and will accept man's superiority only if the latter is aware of how to deserve it. You will never be able to impose your own personality on a boxer through brutal or violent means. He needs to love and respect his master, and only when consideration and trust are exhibited will he show the best of what he is capable. The exceptional intelligence with which the boxer is endowed allows it to learn anything quickly and not to forget it afterwards. From the puppy stage, it is very curious about what is happening around it, and it maintains this attention, even if in different ways also as an adult. It is a very important characteristic for a guard dog, which the boxer is, since it allows it to always be vigilantly attentive towards whatever is happening. Character traits are as important as the morphological ones, since these are hereditarily transmitted in a percentage ranging from 40 to 60%. Certainly, it is not only the attractive and charming aspect that has brought the boxer worldwide success. Personality made up of sweetness, sociality, constitution, decision, courage, determination in combat and balance have also played their part. Among the many who have become fond of the breed, countless individuals have appreciated its traits of intelligence, sociability and proportionate aggressiveness during World War II. Thus the boxer legend was born. 
a legend that comes from afar, that has crossed the millennia and the continents, and which must not be lost and let down by a fistful of money. The true boxer is a marvellous dog, full of life, of pride, joy, energy, and why not, love. It learns with ease. It is not for nothing that it has been used in circus acts and as a dog actor. It has uncommon docility and a fineness of emotions. Hence why this guard and attack dog has been trained as a guide dog for the blind. It is of exceptional constitution that allows it to withstand unpleasant experiences without being harmed. It is the reason for which it excels in civil defence operations, especially those that require intervention on rough ground that may injure its legs. It has provided valid proof of being effective as a police dog, message dog, track and guard dog. The boxer is all this and much more besides, a dog for which character is of equal if not greater importance than physical appearance. If you have children at home, the boxer will provide a sweet game companion for them and worthy of their utmost trust. In its exuberance and its effusive force, a boxer of correct character will never exceed if it realises it is in the company of weaker individuals, whether it be children, the elderly, the sick or other small animals. It is touching to see how a dog, perhaps vivacious and ebullient, shows restraint and keeps its gestures in proportion to the ability of those in its presence to withstand them. It will coax smaller children without ever touching them, running round in circles and frantically wagging the end of its tail. Its ears pushed back on the cranium and its sweet look will show its tender friendship. A warning, however. It will not allow anybody to harm its young friends, not even you. And if you were to scold them, it would certainly try to good-naturedly come between you and them to prevent your intervention. The boxer is a gentle giant, aware of its strength and eager to show its affection. It is said to be good-natured, but is not naive. Heaven help whoever dares to threaten its dear ones, whoever tries to harm those he loves or has placed under his protection, whoever shows themselves as enemies of his small friends, because in this case the reaction will always be instantaneous, undaunted, fearsome and very dangerous. The boxer never attacks, but if forced to do so, all the power contained in its athletic fighter body is released in an instant and deadly manner and its powerful bite, together with the extraordinary massive impact, will get the better of any unwary aggressor in a split second. The real boxer is thus a marvellous concentrate of intelligence, strength, courage, loyalty, goodness and love. Louis Bromfeld, the popular American novelist, lived in the first half of the 20th century, and in his Pleasant Valley he provides a splendid description of the boxer's character, which he knew well, having owned various specimens. Here is what he writes about the entry of the boxer Rex into its house in Paris. It entered the room absolutely sure of itself, took a few steps with dignity, stopped and looked at us. We certainly did not intimidate it, on the contrary. Its personality, its character did not allow us any familiarity. It accepted one of my timid caresses almost like a favour, but having become acquainted, I understood that which it expressed with its look, affection, devotion, loyalty, dignity and independence. In one of his splendid books on boxers, an internationally renowned judge who has raised the breed for many years, discussing their character, writes, the boxer is first of all personality. This is the boxer a creature that tends to assert itself as a dog and that possesses strong individuality. One should never forget that the ancestors of our canine friend and companion had to confront dangers and perils for centuries and that a strong character has been genetically transmitted from generation to generation, capable of fending for itself and of taking appropriate decisions in situations that arose. Whether dealing with a decision to immediately attack a furious bear or to await the arrival of reinforcements, to stop an unruly bull or to intimidate it only a little, or to intervene with speed and decision in helping its master or to wait for an order from him. In every situation, the boxer's ancestors have always had to act by instinct and for the best. And for them, their life was often at stake. The individuality with which the boxer is endowed makes it a sincere and loyal friend of the master and family, but with man it establishes a relationship of collaboration and of mutual trust, without though ever entering into competition with him. They are intelligent and sensitive dogs and will accept man's superiority only if the latter is aware of how to deserve it. 
you will never be able to impose your own personality on a boxer through brutal or violent means. He needs to love and respect his master, and only when consideration and trust are exhibited will he show the best of what he is capable. The exceptional intelligence with which the boxer is endowed allows it to learn anything quickly and not to forget it afterwards. From the puppy stage, it is very curious about what is happening around it, and it maintains this attention, even if in different ways also as an adult. It is very important characteristic for a guard dog, which the boxer is, since it allows it to always be vigilantly attentive towards whatever is happening. Character traits are as important as the morphological ones, since these are hereditarily transmitted in a percentage ranging from 40 to 60 percent. Certainly, it is not only the attractive and charming aspect that has brought the boxer worldwide success. Personality made up of sweetness, sociality, constitution, decision, courage, determination in combat and balance have also played their part. Among the many who have become fond of the breed, countless individuals have appreciated its traits of intelligence, sociability and proportionate aggressiveness during World War II. Thus the boxer legend was born. A legend that comes from afar, that has crossed the millennia and the continents, and which must not be lost and let down by a fistful of money. The true boxer is a marvellous dog, full of life, of pride, joy, energy, and why not, love. It learns with ease. It is not for nothing that it has been used in circus acts and as a dog actor. It has uncommon docility and a fineness of emotions. Hence why this guard and attack dog has been trained as a guide dog for the blind. It is of exceptional constitution that allows it to withstand unpleasant experiences without being harmed. It is the reason for which it excels in civil defence operations, especially those that require intervention on rough ground that may injure its legs. It has provided valid proof of being effective as a police dog, message dog, track and guard dog. The boxer is all this and much more besides, a dog for which character is of equal if not greater importance than physical appearance. If you have children at home, the boxer will provide a sweet game companion for them and worthy of their utmost trust. In its exuberance and its effusive force, a boxer of correct character will never exceed if it realises it is in the company of weaker individuals, whether it be children, the elderly, the sick or other small animals. It is touching to see how a dog, perhaps vivacious and ebullient, shows restraint and keeps its gestures in proportion to the ability of those in its presence to withstand them. It will coax smaller children without ever touching them, running round in circles and frantically wagging the end of its tail. Its ears pushed back on the cranium and its sweet look will show its tender friendship. A warning, however. It will not allow anybody to harm its young friends, not even you. And if you were to scold them, it would certainly try to good-naturedly come between you and them to prevent your intervention. The boxer is a gentle giant, aware of its strength and eager to show its affection. It is said to be good-natured, but is not naive. Heaven help whoever dares to threaten its dear ones, whoever tries to harm those he loves or has placed under his protection, whoever shows themselves as enemies of his small friends, because in this case the reaction will always be instantaneous, undaunted, fearsome and very dangerous. The boxer never attacks, but if forced to do so, all the power contained in its athletic fighter body is released in an instant and deadly manner and its powerful bite together with the extraordinary massive impact will get the better of any unwary aggressor in a split second. The real boxer is thus a marvellous concentrate of intelligence, strength, courage, loyalty, goodness and love. The boxer was born as a work dog. Therefore, to completely and fully develop its personality, it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defence. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defence 
and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous and which are still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defence in the search for buried people. The Breed Club the existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship in which four ATIBOX championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male and likewise for females. The Atibox Work and Track Championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. The boxer was born as a work dog, therefore to completely and fully develop its personality it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defence. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defence, and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous and which are still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defence in the search for buried people. The Breed Club The existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship in which four ATIBOX championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male and likewise for females. The Atibox Work and Track Championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. The boxer was born as a work dog, Therefore, to completely and fully develop its personality, it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defence. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defence, and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous and which are still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defence in the search for buried people.
the Breed Club. The existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship in which four ATIBOX championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male and likewise for females. The ATIBOX work and track championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes, the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days, it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose-fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it, you can take it off when your dog is inside. Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialize with other animals and people. You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honour of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone, that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you're sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you're standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes, the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days, it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose-fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it, you can take it off when your dog is inside. 
Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialize with other animals and people. You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody, and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance, and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honour of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone, that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you are sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you are standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it you can take it off when your dog is inside. Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialize with other animals and people. You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody, and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance, and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honour of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone, that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you are sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you are standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development, so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything, and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. 
This is a serious mistake, since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treaties, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A buildup of vitamins can be harmful, and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements, and if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper, and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. 
there is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty, taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours, then the food passes into the intestine where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. 
the stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fibre, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. 
eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to eighteen months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. 
They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch, which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fibre, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. You can see in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential if pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, 
Puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state, which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks, and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. 
Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. 
A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of Ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes, and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin, such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. 
The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae, which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs, and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari.
They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes, and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrofilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs and those that sleep in the open. 
The damage induced by the presence of the filaria is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito.